Amen, and welcome to worship with us here at Elizabeth Baptist Church, and thank you for your patience as we had a little bit of a delay to our start. That's because we've changed to a new host. We had been hosted by Ustream, many of you that were worshiping with us last Sunday on Easter Sunday. We had about 600 people that were worshiping with us when Ustream went down, and so we've switched hosts because we're also now able to live stream on three different locations simultaneously. So you can watch the live stream of our service on Facebook Live, on our YouTube channel, or on our church website, and you can do that every Sunday from now on. Of course, after the service is over with, it will be archived on our YouTube channel. You can always go back and watch that, uh, but we, are, we will be stri- sh- uh, live streaming in those three venues from this point forward. With respect to Facebook Live, use that to communicate with us and and respond to us, respond to the message. You can even put together a group where all of you can be watching on Facebook Live and you can communicate with one another uh, during that time as well. So again, thank you for worshiping with us. We're delighted that you're connected to us in spirit as we go before the Lord together. Something else that I want to mention to you, and that's what I talked to you about on Wednesday during our devotional, and that is prayer on the mountain. If you will go to the website of Mud Creek Baptist Church, which is up in Hendersonville, and it's just mudcreekchurch.org, just like we're elizabethchurch.org, that's what you're going to see on their homepage. And it is praying on the mountain. It is a vision that God gave a 90-year-old pastor up in the mountains, Reverend Lunsford. He gave him a vision of dedicating May 5th as a day of fasting and prayer. And if you'll click on that, you can watch a video where Greg Mathis, the pastor of Mud Creek, is interviewing Reverend Lunsford. And then after the video, there's a sign-up where you can make a commitment to pray and to fast on May 5th for our nation. Now, this is what we want you to do. We want to sign up together. We want to tell Mud Creek how many people are praying and fasting on that day from Elizabeth Baptist Church, and we want to do that together. So if you're going to make that commitment, you, your family, and if you talk to some friends and they're willing to make the commitment with you, then either get a hold of us via Facebook. You can make that commitment right now if you're there on Facebook Live. Just contact us on Facebook or send an email to us at info at elizabethchurch.org. Give us the family name and how many people are going to attend. So Variel 4, you know, whatever that's going to be. We'll total that up and then we'll send the information to Mud Creek that we're going to join them with prayer on the mountain. Now, the prayer that, the vision that Reverend Lunsford had, had was to go to a specific mountain and pray. But what you're to do is just go somewhere in the outdoors where you feel that personal connection to God and that's where we want you to pray. On May 5th, fasting and prayer somewhere in the outdoors where you will worship God and connect to God in the most beautiful sanctuary that was ever created. And that's the sanctuary that he gifted us with called this planet Earth. I want to have a prayer with you at the beginning of our time in worship, and this is from the Valley of Vision. It's a collection of Puritan prayers, and I'm going to read the prayer that's titled simply The Christian's Prayer, and I'm just going to read the first half of it, but we'll use that to start our worship this morning. Join me as we go before the Lord together. Blessed God, 10,000 snares are mine without and within. Defend me. When sloth and indolence seize me, give me the view of heaven. When sinners entice me, give me disrelish of their ways. When sensual pleasure tempts me, purify and refine me. When I desire worldly possessions, help me to be rich toward you. When the vanities of the world ensnare me, let me not plunge into new guilt and ruin. May I remember the dignity of my spiritual release, never to be too busy to attend to my soul, never to be so engrossed with time that I neglect the things of eternity, but that I may only live for you and grow toward you. Amen and amen. That's what we're going to be talking about this morning, growing in our relationship with the Lord as we consider five blessings that have come out of this social distancing that we've been experiencing. But let's worship the Lord in song together now. In times of uncertainty, do not 
Do not allow clouds of anxiety and fear to close in on us. The way forward is to remind ourselves of what we know to be true and dependable, the unchanging grace of God. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrected me. Let us sing together, resurrect, because your name is victory and all praise will rise to Christ our King.
here. And just wanted to say before I sing, I wanted to thank Joel Michael for his incredible talent. It's always an honor to be able to sing uh, what he plays for me. This is one of my father's favorite songs, and I hope you will enjoy it during this pandemic. I think it's so appropriate to have just a closer walk with thee. Thank you. 
bro. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. And the rest of the team, thank you so much. That was great. It's a good thing uh, we weren't around back during the Lawrence Welk show. You guys would steal the show. We'd have the EBC show going on. So if you have your Bible, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And I said last week we were going to talk about five blessings that come from a societal shutdown. Five blessings that we have uh, with all of this social distancing. And I'm going to give you those five blessings. They're kind of short, pithy sayings. And then... You'll have some corresponding scripture as well for each of those. So here are the five areas where the Lord is really giving us the opportunity to draw closer to him and to be blessed uh, during this time. The first, parents are teaching parents. or I'm sorry, parents are teaching children. I mean, parents should be teaching parents in one way, but parents are teaching children. Second, neighborhoods actually have neighbors now. Third, is time alone with God. Fourth, life can be simple. A lot of times we'll see it's we complicate things ourselves, for ourselves. Uh, But rather, if we'll just look at what we're doing and pull back, life can be very simple. And then last, fifth, worship becomes a priority. So those five blessings. Parents are teaching children. Neighborhoods actually have neighbors again. Time alone with God. Life can be simple. And worship becomes a priority. We're going to look at those five areas. Uh, If you have a notebook, jot those five areas down, leave some space, and and we're going to talk about how God's word speaks to each one of those. But first, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6 is one of the most important passages of the Old Testament. The Jews simply refer to it as the Shema. Uh, Shema is the Hebrew word here. And that's how the passage begins in verse 4. Hear, O Israel. And then you get into a text that is one of the most important texts to Judaism. When you see uh, the Jews in Israel or here in America, an Orthodox Jewish community, the men will wear a leather strap with a box that will be on their wrist or a leather band with a box on it that will be on their, the, uh, their forehead. Inside those boxes are portions of the Shema. The Shema is more than just Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, but verses 4 and 5 are the key verses. And we're going to look all the way to verse 9, but far beyond verse 9, the Shema continues admonishing God's people to follow in his ways. So let's look at it, the very beginning of the text. Shema Yisrael, hear, O Israel. Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. The Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Right there, our religion is a communal religion. He's our God. Together we serve the Lord. And then it says this in Hebrew, Ve'ahavta et Adonai Eloheka. And you shall love the Lord your God. Well, how, how do we love the Lord? Well, it tells us right here three ways that we must love the Lord. Bekol levavka, with all your heart. Uvakol nefshika, with all your, your soul. Uvakol meodaka, with all your strength, with everything that is in you, is how you should love the Lord. Then look at verse 6. And these words which I command you today, they shall be in your heart. I mean, it has to be your life. It's not just you're going through the motions and you're, you're going to worship when other people are going to worship and you're following the commands just as you're watching other people. But no, it's, it's coming from your heart. God is working inside of you and what God is doing inside of you is changing the way you live your life. It's changing the way you interact with one another. Earlier when I had that slip of the tongue and said parents teaching parents. Really, it it is how adults in a home interact with one another comes from within the heart. How we interact with with one another in our workplaces, it comes from inside. How we interact with one another at church when we get back to interacting here at church, it's, it's from within. And from within then proceeds how we live without. Look at verse 7 of Deuteronomy 6. As these things, these commands of God are in your heart, and you're loving God with all your soul and all your strength, verse 7 says, and you shall teach them diligently to your children. 
You know, Hebrew, like English, it has a second person singular and a second person plural. I mean, you singular and you plural. This is second person singular. You individually have the command from God that you should be teaching your children the commands of God. And the best way you teach your children the commands of God is to live out those commands from the heart. You know, from, with your soul, with your strength. It, verse 7 goes on and says, You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. I mean, when your kids are around you or your grandchildren are around you, you should be sharing with them God's truths all the time, imparting God's wisdom to them. And that's where verses 8 and 9 as I mentioned, the phylacteries, both for on the arm and also on the forehead. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. I mean, obviously, Orthodox Jews took that incredibly literal. And they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And then verse 9, you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. If you go to Israel, and many of you who are watching have been to Israel with me in the past, anytime you cross the threshold of an entrance to a, a hotel room, the hotel, a house, you'll see on the doorposts uh, a, a little box, and it's canted just a little bit. It's not straight up and down vertical. It's canted off to the side. Inside that box, just like the phylacteries, is the Shema. And it's canted because it demonstrates our relationships with God as sinful human beings. They're never perfect. We're never clearly in line with him. Because of our sin and our selfishness, it's canted a little bit. But as our worship team led us in song, it's God's forgiveness and grace. It's the work of God through the Messiah, Jesus Christ, that allows us to be straightened out again through his blood, through his grace. We have the forgiveness of sins. But this passage is so important because it reminds us that the first duty that we have in life to God and then also to the larger society is to teach the children that God brings into our lives. Moms, dads, grandmothers, grandfathers, those of you that have had the kids inside the house during the working week more than perhaps ever before except for when they were very, very small, God's giving you a blessing. And, and the kids, God, God's blessing, those children that are watching, God's blessing you with the time that you're able to spend with your family right now. Use this time well. Uh, Education in Ancient Israel is a book that came out in 1998. It was written by one of my advisors um, during my college years. In my years at Duke, Dr. James Crenshaw, he's the professor emeritus of Old Testament and Hebrew Bible at Duke, he wrote this, and, and I'm just going to get to the conclusion of the matter. And here in, in Education in Ancient Israel, Dr. Crenshaw writes this, in the ancient Near East, education preceded literacy, and it arose as an effort to create an orderly society that was characterized by a certain kind of utilitarian morality. So they understood very well, let me unpack that sentence, that the real essence of education is learning how to live the right kind of life so that morally uh, we would have a positive influence on those around us, not a negative influence, and that positive influence morally on the people around us, and as other people are having a similar positive influence on the people around them, our society becomes more orderly and more structured and therefore more efficient and effective for the benefit of all. And, and to understand this is true education, which is why he says education precedes literacy. Here's a statement that the first pastor I served under used to make. And he used to say, learning how to make a living is important, but learning how to live is much more important. Don't ever forget that. Dr. Crenshaw continues, and he says this, the primary teachers in this community were the parents, and the home provided the natural setting for instruction. Indirectly, the entire adult population contributed to the moral training, for parents used communal insights, often formulated into maxims or proverbs, 
to persuade their children that the teachings had a wider sanction than just that of the individual household. What parents were really trying to impart to children was the understanding that the lessons being taught and hopefully the lessons learned have application far beyond the home and will apply the rest of their lives. This blessing of parents teaching children is something that we, we should hold on to and seek to develop as we come out of this social distancing. You know, the public school system, as wonderful as it is in many ways, was really never intended to be the place where the children of our society got the majority of their instruction. And yet, ironically, during the school year, uh, Monday through Friday, during the waking hours, children will spend a, a, a much larger portion of their lives with the adults that are a part of a public school system, whether it's teachers or coaches, than they will their own parents. You, know, you, you think about it, society was never really geared to be that way. We were never geared to have a, 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 a daycare system with a sports program thrown into it for children from age five all the way to 18, and where they would spend the majority of their waking hours during those incredibly formative years with people other than their parents. It's the parents that impart and should teach that greatest of lessons to the children, and that's how to live a good life. We have the blessing of getting back to that right now, and I hope and pray that as you're watching, you're considering how you can use this time to the greatest advantage for your kids, for your grandkids, but also for your own lives. Parents teaching children is truly a blessing. The second blessing is that neighborhoods actually have neighbors again. And last week when the Justice family kind of messaged in during Facebook Live and we responded to, to their comment about just being, things slowing down, life slowing down, I elaborated and said, I've noticed that in my own neighborhood. Shannon and I have lived in the neighborhood where we reside for 13 years now. And in the last month, we've seen more activity in the neighborhood with neighbors interacting with one another as we're working in our yard, people coming by and talking, children riding bicycles. You can hear a bat and ball hitting all the time. We have hear more of this and see more of this in the last month than in the last 13 years put together. And why? We can be so hectic with our lives, but, but yet learning to appreciate those who are right around us is so very important. You recognize Deuteronomy 6 as the first commandment. Remember our Lord Jesus said when asked, which was the greatest of the commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, he added with all your mind, and with all your strength. But then he said there's a second commandment, like unto the first. And what is that? Love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, listen to the passage in Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 17 and 18. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. And what that means is you look out for your neighbor and when you see your neighbor is doing something wrong that perhaps morally or legally is going to bring about some negative ramification in your neighbor's life, you know, your job is to step in and lovingly encourage your neighbor. And then verse 18 you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, that is your neighbors, but rather you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. The same concern that you have for your own life, you should have concern for your neighbor. And this time of social distancing from all of the other connections that we can have in society, as those have been cut off to a degree, we're making stronger connections to the people that we live around every day. And that's a blessing. As you're walking around for however long we're still having this, these mitigation measures in place, as you're walking around your neighborhood, talk to the people that you see. As, as people stop to talk to you, even though you might be working in your yard and you might be thinking, hey, I've only got you know, half an hour to get this done, you can come back to that. Be a neighbor once again to the people in your neighborhood. You'll be blessed and they'll be blessed for it. We've got the blessing of parents teaching children. We have the blessing of neighborhoods being filled with neighbors once again. And here's a third blessing. Time alone with God. 
That brings us to Luke. Turn, if you would, in your Bible to Luke uh, chapter 5. In Luke chapter 5, uh, we pick up in verse 12. This is early in, in our Lord's ministry. And in Luke 5, 12, we read, It happened when Jesus was in a certain city that, behold, a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus, and he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And then he put out his hand and he touched him. And Jesus said, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he charged the man, tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them, just as Moses commanded. However, the report, verse 15 went around concerning him all the more, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by Jesus of their infirmities. And look at our Lord's reaction, verse 16. He's healed a man. The word has gone out that he has this power of God. Many more people are coming. The multitudes are coming for legitimate ministry reasons. They want to be healed. They want to experience the power of God. And at the same time our Lord is willing to heal, verse 16 says, So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. He himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Christian, do you have a time in your life where you spend just with God? We talk about uh, Sabbath day being important, and it is. It's very important for us to have a Sabbath time, and typically we come together on Sundays. But we can come together on Sundays and still be so busy with what's going on at church, preparing for perhaps a meal after church, or you're a Sunday school teacher and you're getting ready for your lesson, or you've got a series of meetings in the afternoon. And we can be running from one event to another event to another event to another event. And though they may all be ministry events, we've got to stop and ask ourselves the question, are we really spending time with God? And just before our service got started, as the worship team was up here, we were talking with one another and I asked, what, what's something that God has spoken to you or something that you have really come to appreciate in the time that we've been worshiping with an empty sanctuary as we're reaching out to all of you that have connected with us online? And uh, the comment that came forward from one of the members of the worship team was just how moving it has been to connect to the Lord when we're really just singing to him. You know, we, we know that you're watching. We know that there's things that have to be right. Our tech team is doing such a good job of keeping up to pace and everything that's going on. And yet at the same token, when we really boil it down, what is this all about? It is about a connection to God first and foremost, the first and, and greatest commandment. And we're experiencing that. Friend, are you experiencing that? This time where everything is slowing down, and even though, unfortunately, you're not able to be in the sanctuary, the question is, have you created a sanctuary for yourself to interact with the living God? Because if you're not able to create that sanctuary for yourself to interact with the living God, have that Sabbath connection with him, then you would be hard-pressed to find it even if you walk into a place that is designated as a sanctuary like this beautiful building here at Elizabeth. Find that time with God. In 2003, uh, Tilden Edwards wrote a book titled Sabbath Time. And I want to share with you a quote from that book about how important it is to take time to worship the Lord. And even though he's talking about Sabbath, he's talking about more than just the Sabbath day. Yes, we should have a, a Sabbath day where we are focusing primarily on that day on the Lord. But we also need Sabbath moments throughout our lives where we've learned how to cultivate that personal time with God. Jesus is our example for that. I mean, if anyone was able to go and go and go and go and go and not burn out, it should have been Jesus, right? But Jesus often, as you saw in the scriptures, withdrew to a deserted place in order to spend time alone with the Father. And some of you are going to commit to do that very thing on May 5th as we pray on the mountain, as we pray somewhere in the outdoors. We go to a secluded place and we, we fast and we seek the Lord. But we need to do that not just on May 5th. We need to do that regularly if we're going to grow spiritually. 
Listen to what Edward says in his work, Sabbath Time. Since I'm focusing on a family Sabbath day, a word needs to be said about the role of parents, just like what Dr. Crenshaw said about education in the ancient Near East. Mothers and fathers share a special ministerial and priestly function with the rest of the church. That is, they are spiritual guides for their children. They are the heads of the domestic church. Helping to assure and shape a Sabbath time for the family is a valuable dimension of their guidance. As has been pointed out, one lesson Christians need to learn from Jews is a special spiritual role of parents together with the home as a center of true rather than parachurch liturgy. Again, where is the true spiritual education of the children to take place? Is it back in our children's ministry in one of the rooms where Lori and Crystal are teaching them? Or is it in the youth area with David? No. Even though those are very important, the primary place our kids and youth are to learn spiritual principles is right where they are right now with you at your dining table, in your living room, right in your house is where they need to learn that the most important thing they can do in life is keep a regular schedule with God and push out the busyness of the world, and have a Sabbath routine. Edwards continues where he says, Church, as an exclusive another place with other leaders in our culture, can turn the family into one more passive consumer unit that becomes dependent on others to provide structure, meaning, and faith. That third blessing that's coming out of this social distancing is prayerfully the reality for you that EBC, as important as it may be in your life, and your participation in the life of this community is incredibly important to us, but none of it is more important than what we're doing spiritually in our own own homes. That starts with me in my relationship with Shannon, and that's with you in your relationship with the people in your house. What we're doing in our homes spiritually is got to be the foundation for what we do when we come together here at Elizabeth Baptist Church. Let's never forget this blessing as we come out of this time of social distancing. Here's the fourth blessing. The first one, parents teaching children. The next one, neighborhoods actually being filled with neighbors. The third, time alone with God. The fourth, life can actually be simple. In Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 through 12, this is what we read. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another, and indeed you do so toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia. So Paul is encouraging the church in Thessalonia, and, and, and he is telling them, keep doing what you're doing, you're growing in the Lord. And then at the same token, he goes on to say, but we urge you, brethren, that you would increase more and more. And verse 11 is our key verse, that you would also aspire to lead what kind of life? A busy life? A rat race life? You know, even if it's good things that you're committed to? No, the opposite, a quiet life. Lead a quiet life. Mind your own business. Work with your hands as as has been commanded to you that you would walk properly toward those who are outside. That is, that you would set an example toward those who are outside of the faith as to what a real centered life, a good life, a peaceful life looks like. And that in doing so, you would lack nothing at all, but you would be a whole person in your relationship with God and in your relationship with others. You know, as we embarked on this um, time of, of social distancing, something that the Lord spoke to me was this. Uh, and we, we can have a very busy operational tempo here at Elizabeth Baptist Church. It's a church of 1,300 plus members. And it's not 1,300 plus members just sitting around, even though our active membership isn't, isn't that number of 13. Our active membership is more like between seven and 800 people. But it is just that. 
an active membership. We're doing missions projects. We're doing missions projects locally. We do missions projects regionally. We do mis missions projects internationally. We we're doing all sorts of things at Elizabeth, discipleship-wise. You name it, we've got something going on from the cradle to the grave. We are, we are a busy ministry. And there have been times where I've thought, well, I'm so busy. I've got, we've got to do this. I've got to do that. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. And there's other things that I know need to get done, and they're not getting done. And I think to myself, well, it's because I'm so busy to do all these things. And as we embarked into this social distancing, this is what the Lord said to me. Look, if you can't get this stuff done now, it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with your schedule. It has to do with you. And so as I took that to heart and realized, you know, Lord, it's true, my life, our lives, can be much more simple than what we've made them out to be. See, God gives each one of us a gift, and it's the same exact gift that we have. And you've heard this said before, perhaps in another way, perhaps in a similar way. But that gift that he gives every one of us every day is 24 hours. And we have the, we have the privilege and the opportunity to determine how we're going to use that 24 hours. And if we'll sit back and look, I'm like, well, what did I do? What did I spend my time doing here? What, did, what, did, you know, what was it that prevented me from getting this done? As we begin to look at what's really going on in our lives, you remember what we just read in Deuteronomy? Where, where does it all start? It's not outside. It starts inside. And so I've prayed, Lord, help me, reveal to me ways in which I can simplify things so that less can be more, first and foremost for you, but then also for your people, the church, for my family. And I pray that you would do the same thing. Go on this journey of where, where it is that the Lord can help you to make adjustments to your own schedule, to your own set of priorities, where as you reprioritize things, you actually find yourself moving in a stronger spiritual direction for your benefit and for the benefit of all who share in your life. The blessing of parents teaching children, the blessing of neighborhoods actually being filled with neighbors again, the blessing of time alone with God, and the blessing that life can actually be simple. And we close with the, the last blessing and perhaps the most important blessing. Worship has become a priority. As I said earlier in the conversation with the worship team this morning, our worship is, is unto the Lord. We want you to be a part of it. We want you to share in it. But first and foremost, what we do, every song that's sung, every scripture that's read, every word that's spoken about the Holy Scriptures, it is all to the glory of God. That is the first and foremost priority. The secondary priority is then how it connects with us as we come together as a church. But the first connection has got to be established, and that's our connection to the living God. In Revelation chapter 22, I want to share verses 8 and verse 9, 8 and 9. John says, I saw and I heard these things. And when I heard and I saw this incredible vision, he said, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Let me tell you, that's easy to do. When something is powerful and something moves you, something grips you, something is, is certainly helping to change you, it is easy to get committed to that thing and actually not be committed to the Lord. And that angel realizes that as, as significant as this message is that the angel is delivering to John in this vision, the angel realizes that as powerful as he is as a messenger of God, the angel knows first and foremost, look, John, no, redirect your focus. Look at verse 9. The angel said to John, see that you do not do this. For I am your fellow servant and of your brethren the prophets and of those who keep the words of this book. And what's the angel's admonition? Worship God. And one of the things that this is allowing us to realize as a church is that the first and foremost priority in loving God is worshiping God. It's connecting to God. Sure, we have our preferences. You know, people have style of music preference, style of clothing preference, you know, style of worship preference, which ties in with both of those, the previous two things I mentioned. You know, but, but all of those things are preferences. Preferences that no doubt may move you, but none of those preferences are important as your position and your connection with the living God. Worship is about God. 
Worship isn't about so much what I like. Worship isn't about what you like. Worship is about the living God. Tom Rainier, former president of Lifeway Ministries, in his book, Great Awakenings, he, he writes something very interesting about preaching and how the preaching of the gospel has to be uh, absolutely grounded in the word. In a study that was done uh, in the late 1980s, this is what came out of that study. Less than one-fourth of evangelical sermons could be classified as expository, that is, as messages that were expounding on the word of God, and the message was driven by the word of God. Surprisingly, he goes on to say, over one half of the sermons, listen to this, over one half of the sermons had no biblical passage or as its basis for truth. And you can see that in today's day and age. Where you can turn on a television, or you can get online, and you can watch a ministry, and if you listen, and if you really listen, and you've got your Bible open, the vast majority of what's being said is not grounded in the Scripture, it's an opinion. Or it's a motivational speech, just to get you encouraged and have you feel better, which is wonderful. You know, there's a place for motivational speaking and encouragement. Let me tell you, that place isn't the pulpit of the living God where worship of the living God should take place. Because the thing that will motivate us the most in life is when we're worshiping God alone. As we have the worship team come up and close us with our final song, I just challenge you, fellow believer and worshiper of the Lord Jesus Christ, have you found these five things to be a blessing for you during this time? Parents and grandparents, are you pouring everything you can in, during this time of blessing into your children and your grandchildren? In your neighborhood, are you being a neighbor and are you willing to receive encouragement from your neighbors as they might come by to visit you and say hello to you? Are you using your time wisely because you're in control of your, your calendar and if you don't control your calendar, other people will control it for you. Uh, but you're ultimately the one that can control your calendar. Are you using it to spend time with God and to simplify life? And lastly, during this time, are you realizing the thing that we do as the church that is the most important is we worship the living God and we connect to him through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's my prayer for you. It's my prayer for all of us as we would continue to grow together in our relationships with the Lord and in our relationships with each other. Let's worship the Lord now.
Amen, and thank you again for worshiping with us today. If you haven't already, remember to go to Mud Creek Baptist Church website and then sign up with us. Sign up either on Facebook or on a, you know, contact us via email, info at elizabethchurch.org, and give us the family name and how many people are committing to pray and to fast on May 5th. So we look forward to doing that together. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. God bless you. We love you in Jesus Christ.